Welcome to Civil War Digital Digest. I'm Will. Welcome to the mess hall in the 1848 limestone barracks at Historic Fort Wayne. The Historic Fort Wayne Coalition has made it possible for us to shoot episodes here and we say thanks to them. We also want to say thanks to the CWDD Coffee Grinders. They're our membership over on Patreon. Patreon is a website that allows you to select how much you think you can give monthly and that little bit adds up with everybody else's. It makes it possible for us to shoot these episodes, technically travel the sites and put some money away for historic preservation. So we want to say thanks to them. Today, historian Andrew Roscoe is joining us again and we're going to take a turn from a conversation the last time we saw Andy. Welcome back. Thanks, Will. So last time we talked with you, we talked in a more academic setting uh, about the flying column and Hooker's preparation for what would become the Chancellorsville campaign. Yeah, we were talking then about the concept of flying columns, light division, and we wanted to actually show, I wanted to show what that would have meant for the individual soldier to go from the big picture down to what that means for an individual soldier and how that can equate for living historians and historians talking about the Chancellorsville campaign. Okay, great. So we're gonna go to the uh, written, and written orders for what will be the Chancellorsville campaign. Where do we come from? So starting here, I picked a description of an early war load for an individual soldier. This description comes from Rufus Dawes, who at the time was a captain in the 6th Wisconsin Infantry, ends up as a colonel in the famous Iron Brigade. Okay, great. Where is Dawes at the time of this description? So Dawes is in Fredericksburg in May of 1862 uh, during the Peninsula Campaign. And this is when the First Corps is trying to join McClellan, which they never end up doing because of actions of Stonewall Jackson. But this is really their first march. And so this is a good idea of where the army is coming from early in the war. Great. Well, let's take a second here and let's listen to Dawes as he describes this knapsack. The men were here absurdly overburdened. They had been required to carry each an overcoat, an extra pair of shoes, and an extra pair of pants. These superfluous articles added to the necessary hundred rounds of ball cartridges, shelter tent, gum and woolen blankets, haversack full of rations, canteen full of water, muskets and accoutrements were a load beyond the strength of ordinary men. Our boys were broken down by the needless overtaxing of their strength. Rufus Dawes, 6 Wisconsin. So that's a heck of a lot of kit for anybody who's a living historian. I mean, let me just back up here. My knapsack will normally look like this at a campaign event, carrying blanket, shelter tent, gum blanket, and a few small pieces. And if you turn this sideways, those are just absolutely gigantic. Complete nine day difference and much heavier. Okay. Uh, talk to me anything more you want to tell me about that kit. So a lot of this is extra clothing or things that, you know, going into the summer in Virginia are things that soldiers don't need to be carrying with them. And I think that's where the changes come, is the idea that the Army realized that soldiers were carrying too many things and instead could be carrying less weight, but changing some of that weight to carry more food, which would change the logistics of the Army. In your experience as a historian, do you see the Army making some of these changes, throwing things away or stuff like that? Is this carried all of 1862 or does this change? I'm going to say that this is soldiers on their first campaign, and even in the descriptions from that, you see men throwing all sorts of stuff away. I think as they got better about it, that as men were on campaign more, they started to figure out what they needed, what they didn't need, but that also meant that they were wasting items, throwing them away, instead of them properly being put into storage and being either stored for that soldier later or returned to the supply system, something like that. Okay, so well, then that's happening intrinsically within the Army as a man and as men learn what they need to do. Now we get to the experiment with the uh, light division and the flying column comes up. What are the orders going into the spring of 1863? So uh, in early April 1863, Hooker releases the first orders for the Chancellorsville campaign. Originally he intended to launch the campaign in April, but there was a large rainstorm, it delayed it. But the idea for it is he released these orders, and this is widely commented upon from soldiers, officers throughout the army. For example, Colonel de Trobian from the Third Corps discusses that not only was this order issued, but it was carried out, which is something that's important. It's great to read that orders were written, but it's important to see from soldiers' diaries and from accounts that they were carried out. So having someone like a colonel saying that he was enforcing this or reading someone like Rufus Dawes 
about how he was enforcing his regiment shows that not only was this something the army wanted to try, but it was actually enacted. Well, let's get to it. Uh, we've got a bunch of stuff laid out here. What am I looking at? So laid out here, I put out what a soldier would have carried. Now the things up front are small personal items, and these are the kind of things that a soldier would have carried in his pockets. These are things that he never wants to lose. His knife, his tobacco and pipe, his wallet, matches, and a uh, handkerchief. Those are the kind of items that a soldier never wants to be separated from, so he never wants it to be on a piece of gear that can be torn from him. Well, that's great. What's the rest of this stuff? So the rest of this stuff, besides a few personal items, are what the orders say the soldiers had to carry for the campaign. So we are trying to show as close to what the ideal in Hooker and Butterfield's mind was for what a flying a soldier would carry in the campaign. Okay, well, when we think back, we talked about eight days ration, five days of meat on the hoof. I've got three days of rations in already in the haversack. Talk to me about the rest of what I'm seeing. So here is the other five days worth of food minus the protein. So you've got 50 crackers, You've got coffee and sugar. Additionally, you have 20 rounds of ammunition to bring the total load of soldiers carrying is up to 60 rounds of ammunition. 40 in my box, 20 additional. Exactly. Okay. And then beyond that, you have the personal items that were, you were still supposed to carry. A set of underclothes, shirt, underwear, socks. You've got a blanket and shelter half, as well as your gum blanket. All right, great. Well, let's actually take a look here. Let's see how this fits in because this is different than anything I've ever carried before. As we were prepping the episode, I made an assumption looking at everything and we'll see if that holds true or not. I set this up to be rolled and put on top the knapsack thinking it was gonna take a lot of space. Let's see how we do here, so. And one of the things that the, in the after action reports that was recommended was that in the pouch closest to the back is where clothing and cloth items would go to make the load easier on the soldier's back. So, well, let's take that. That's hindsight being 2020 for the uh, army, but for me, that was exactly the first choice I was gonna make as I just seemed to be where things fit. So if I do this and then I'll buckle it up, and then on top of that, I'll put the uh, gum blanket and buckle that up. Again, that gives me, from somebody who's done this before and seen different things in both in experience and reading about soldiers, I've got the ability to reach into my back and pull this out as rain gear. Now I've still got a bunch of stuff to go, including a whole bunch of these crackers. Uh, should take a second here and say thank you to our friend Robbie Cook and his company Escape by Design. Robbie's been working with 3D printing and hardtack manufacturing and letting the two meet in the middle. He's found Liberty, another contractor to the federal government, and has reproduced their hardtack and will soon have it for sale as well as the 3D hardtack cracker stamps, if I'm understanding correctly. So, be another source within the living history community. But for now, I gotta figure out how to carry all this stuff. Let's see, thank you, sir. My goodness, hang on a second, let's pull that out. Let's try this. Okay, first time, let's see what's gonna happen here. I'm not quite sure because Usually when we're shooting episodes, I test all this stuff ahead of time to show you food or other things. When it comes to this, this is just a mess because this is the first time doing it. Those and, but you know what, Well, that's probably a great thing because when these soldiers did it during the campaign, it was the first time for them too. This was new and untried for them. They, uh, you know, from when this order came out, they had to be packed and ready for this. And there's a great account from the 17th Maine, also in that same brigade in the Red Diamond Division, that they were drawing an extra day's ration every day to refill what they were drawing from their haversacks. So what you're saying is they had three days or eight days with them in camp until it was time to leave on the campaign. And just every day the commissary had to, to refill the previous day's rations. Correct. Not too bad for a soldier, but that's got to be pretty miserable for the commissary officers. I'm sure it was a logistical headache. <laughs> My goodness, okay. Uh, 50 crackers. We're going to have to take a look at this and going to tie this up just to make it a little bit safer in here. Last thing I want to do is have sugar or coffee all over the bottom of my knapsack and not able to be gotten quickly. Um, I think I'm gonna lay the ammunition in across the top here. More easy no, I'm talking access. About, uh, not only easy access, but when you flip it, it's gonna be covered and again, not wanting the ammunition to get wet. It's gonna be tucked inside here. And with the space I have, I think I'll just take the wallet that I have here and put that there. 
So as you can see with this, it leaves very little room for personal items in there. And as uh, when we talked about this before, we, had, we talked about Rufus Dawes from the 6th Wisconsin saying that he had to make sure that his men were, that his officers were inspecting their knapsacks to make sure Bibles, playing cards, things like that were thrown away so that this was as small of a load as possible. Interesting to hear the same man talking about both. Give us this example and then talk about having to enforce these orders differently. Yeah, it's amazing what 11 months can do for the story of soldiers from one regiment. Great. Well, let's do the last piece here. I've got this buckled up and then let's just go quickly on top. And thank you, sir. If you think back to our episode on packing a knapsack, you remember that Jeremy talked about running the coat straps or the blanket straps through the shoulder strap to keep the roll on top closer to your head and not flopping around as much. I'm gonna take that advice from him and go ahead and use it here. There we go. There's a full knapsack for Chancellorsville following the written orders now. I know a lot of fellas in the living history world don't like knapsacks and like to just carry a blanket roll. What options, I mean, were there options here or what, how does this sit with the orders? From reading the after action reports from the quartermasters, there was strict adherence to soldiers carrying knapsacks in the campaign. And part of the reason we know this is just how many knapsacks got lost. Uh, some corps lost, uh, the average across the army is estimated to be about 25% of men lost their knapsacks during the campaign that were not wounded. So men who dropped their knapsacks prior to going to action, which of course is a problem if you have five days worth of food on your back that you no longer have rations for the rest of the campaign. Some corps like the 12th Corps had over 4,600 lost. The 3rd Corps fighting literally next door to them only lost 700 in the whole campaign. Wow. Well, I can just think, you know, feeling what I have on my back and what that felt like. First off, this is a lot more awkward than a knapsack I'm used to wearing. Just it's the weight of the crackers as I swing. Weights further out. The weights back, further yeah. out and wants to keep going when I try to stop. But man, I can just imagine having being ordered to drop this and not be able to get back to it. I've got five days of food. I hope we find supplies here. So, yeah, it's uh, it definitely was an interesting experiment from the army. Wow. Well, let me swing out of this because let's take one final look here. All right, there we go. Knapsacks are sometimes a little more awkward than you would think, but let's take a look at this real quick. In the middle, we have what I would use standard in living history. This is less comfortable, but let me tell you, the weight difference between here and here is probably four or five pounds. Probably, yeah. Andy, thank you very much for helping us through this as we look specifically what it might be like as a living history to get ready for Chancellorsville. Here you have it. There's the orders. Knapsacks, carry them. Love them, don't love them, doesn't matter. Orders are orders, carry them. Chancellorsville, as we know it, here you are for the Army of the Potomac. For the Civil War Digital Digest, I'm Will. Thanks for spending your time with us. We'll see you soon.